Well, they're dismissing. If you can find your place in the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be in chapter 6 again this morning, Luke chapter 6. It's a rather uneventful dismissal. We need to get more bus kids in. It's kind of quiet. Wasn't it a little bit of a letdown? Maybe the... Did Charlie just go in there? Okay, Charlie's going in there. It'll, it'll, things will pick up soon. <laughs> Luke chapter 6. Good to see you all back. All you guys went to places for Memorial Day. And then everybody else left when you came back. This is that vacation time of the year. The beginning of the summer and the end of the summer. And uh, it's like you never know who's going to be there. You never know who isn't going to be there. So good to see you guys. Glad you're here. Eddie and Michelle are back from baby shower. And I always mix up Maine. Maine. I mix up Maine and Massachusetts because they both start with MA and I don't go there very often. So, but Maine's got lobsters. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I need to get up there and eat some lobster. Would you eat lobster? You don't. You're allergic to seafood. I like the lobster. No. Oh, you had some. Way to go. Good job, Michelle. Yeah. Did you bring any lives back with you? There's a guy from Maine in our church in Delray Beach used to bring them back in his coat pockets. <laughs> oh, you can get them at the airport, though. Can you? Yeah. And what do they, they ship them? You can take them no, on plane? No, you take them on to carry them. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll go to the airport in Maine sometime. I'm going to put that on my bucket list. I definitely would pay probably more than it's worth for a lobster if I could carry it on an airplane. Well, I'm starting a campaign to save the lobster. <laughs> well, he's, he's a, he's a well, I can't eat him. Nobody. Can. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we are far, far away from where we are going. So, we're all going to Maine after this, I think. <laughs> Luke chapter six. We're going to read our passage of scripture we began this series with, and then we're going to sing the song. Okay, so just get ready for it, and hopefully they'll start singing in there, and we'll just sing right back at them, maybe. But you, you know what song it is, right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Okay. We're getting ready for it. Terry, do you know that song? Oh, yeah. Could you lead us in it? Because I always mess up the words. <laughs> okay. I'll have Terry lead us. You don't have to come up here. You're just right where you're at. But we'll, we'll read our passage, and then you'll, we'll sing the song, okay. and then we'll preach. So, and when we sing it, I want you guys to sing so the kids' church can hear it. Okay. I want them to know that we have fun in here, even if it's not true. I want to look forward to graduating from junior church and getting to be an adult church. Verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. All right, we're going to pray and then we're going to sing the song. Father, I pray that you would enlighten us with your word this morning. God, I pray that the promises that are in the scripture this morning will be ones that we would claim. The truths that are in the Scripture this morning will be ones that, uh, Lord, you would grant us understanding of. And, Father, I ask that you would give us with all the determination that we would be able to have these simple truths transform our lives. We thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Terry? We'll start with the foolish man. The foolish man, okay. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up, and the house on the sand went splash. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. So build your house. 
house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord. Yeah, okay, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I, see, I'm glad you did that. <laughs> I always get the kids' songs wrong because I wasn't allowed to have fun when I was a kid. So I don't know. Come on now. It's just a joke. It's kind of half true, but joking. <laughs> Come back. Just, just ignore it, okay? They're, it's, it's just they're trying to get revenge or something back there. So anyway, man, Charlie won't quit though. <laughs> we began this passage of scripture a couple of weeks ago, really with focusing on the promise of the things that we're going to see. We're going to see the last of those here today. But the promise to me in this passage of scripture is positively amazing. Have you ever been overwhelmed at the idea that you're supposed to know? The scripture and rightly divide it. Is it? I mean, to me, Second Timothy two fifteen: Study shall thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is to me a charge. It's a command. It's not just to preachers. Although Timothy is a is a young man who is a preacher of the gospel, but it's to believers. I don't know about you, but even verses like James four seventeen that say, "Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin." And the burden to know what the Bible says and do it, it's like it's a lot, isn't it? Sometimes I think about I'm, I'm an avid reader, and I was uh, since I was Josiah's age. You guys know Josiah, right? He's is he, is he six now? Seven. 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 Turned seven. Okay, so Josiah's seven. About a year, year and a half ago, Josiah started really reading. Uh, about a year and a half ago, when he was in kindergarten, he started reading riddles. He come on. Sunday nights and read me riddles, and it was hilarious. Absolutely the funniest thing in the world because he didn't get them at all, but he's reading them, you know. <laughs> and so if you'd answer the riddle and you give him the right answer, he'd tell you no because it was like the something instead of you just telling him the something it was, you know, if you answer the question. And I can't remember riddles, so I can't tell you the ones that Josiah had, but it was really cute. But now Josiah's a reader, and uh, almost to the point where he, I think his parents are going to do what mine did when I was a kid. My parents used to ground me from reading. <laughs> they would take my books away. They say you're allowed to read the Bible and nothing else, and uh, they would, you know, they punish me for reading. And so I, I don't think his parents have probably had that idea yet. But for Josiah's sake, I'm not going to tell him what my parents did. But uh, he's he's a reader. So am I. I'm an avid reader, uh, and I'm not. I don't read about avids. Pat, uh, Patrick McManus was an avid hunter. And he, you know, he wrote the sports, uh, the field and stream, humorous interpretation things. And he uh, told his friend that he was an avid hunter. And his friend said, "Really? When did you start hunting avids? You are not." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, anyway, I'm an avid reader in the sense that I read all the time. And I realize sometimes the volume of stuff I read. Actually, I read. If I were to take a percentage of my life that I read, I read a very, very high percentage of my waking hours of the day. Even if I'm not reading, I'm reading. Like nowadays, you know, it's the smartphone. And I'm always reading news articles or whatever, uh, reading Kindle, reading. It's just something's always on my smartphone. When I'm home, I'm reading. If, if I don't have a book, I've got a, a laptop or I've got a smartphone or if I'm talking to somebody. You know, I have to watch it when I'm on conversation on the phone that I'm not reading an article while I'm talking to people. You know, it's really hard. My mom used to say, you're not listening. You know, you know, I was always because I was always reading something. So I do read a lot. And I've got books that I read frequently. There are books that I read at least once a year, and there are books I read a couple times every year, and it's not they're not the Bible. They're they're books other than the Bible. A book I read at least once a year is The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Now you probably don't read that book, but it's about this thick. It's bigger than the Bible, but I read it once a year, and it's to remind myself of the evils that happen when men accept uh, immorality. And that's essentially what happened that caused the rise of Adolf Hitler. When things happen and, uh, and, and evil is allowed by men's greed and men's 
purpose, men's personal purposes, when evil is allowed to be per perpetrated for personal gain, the, the, the capabilities of the average person to do evil are just, it's, it's boundless. And it's a reminder to me. I go to Holocaust exhibits or museums, usually at least one a year from a different place. I was just in D.C. this past week, and I didn't have time, but one of the places I wanted to go when I was there was the Holocaust Museum in D.C. I've been to Holocaust museums locally, other places. It's upsetting to me. My stomach's upset. By the time I come out of one of those places, it makes me sick. But it also is just a reminder to me how, how quickly mankind degenerates for different reasons. And so that's a book I read. I think it's good for me. It's good for me to read. I think it would be good for you to read. If you've never read a book like The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich or... Uh, one of those books, one of the doctor's books, or whatever. If you've never done that, you can read a, a book like Auschwitz, a, a Jewish doctor's perspective, and so forth. There's just a number of books I read every year. There are some books I read every couple of years. I read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn every couple of years. Why? Because I like to, that's why. And so I read, I like that book. I like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Uh, there are books that I read, and they're just for my, for my entertainment. I read... I read articles. You could, you could put the most boring magazine out somewhere where I'm at, and I'll read it. Why? Because it's just what I do. I read all the time. But I'll tell you something I don't naturally do. I don't naturally read this book. You say, Pastor, shame on you. No, I'm not saying I don't read this book. I'm saying it just doesn't... It just, I don't just pick up my Bible in the morning and, and get so absorbed in it. Uh, now, there have been times that that's so. There are days that that's so. But it isn't every single day of my life that I'm in the Word of God reading it and absorbing it. And it, it, there's not a book in the world that could help me like a book that's different than all the other books. A book that's inspired by God, it's given by God, preserved by God, and uh, that I'm commanded to read, commanded to understand, commanded to know. And if you're honest about it, you can play spiritual here this morning, but if you're honest about it, you're just like me as far as that goes, except you may not be just like me and that you read all the time. Some, some of the folks here in this room that I know, you don't like to read at all. If it came down to it, you wouldn't read at all. Or some of some folks in this room that I know of have very it's very very difficult to read. It's, it's not because you don't have the skills to read, but just there are things that inhibit you from physically being able to read. Uh, Brother Nelson's not here this morning; he'll be here this evening. But uh, he's blind, and he's always trying to find things that he can listen to because I mean, he's, he, Nelson's a very intelligent guy, and he just likes to know information. He memorizes things. You wouldn't just believe I can know things. Uh, but he's always asking pastors, there a Christian book that's, that's in audio format that I could listen to, you know? And uh, he, he'll listen to anything, read anything. He's just a reader. But it's not as easy for him to read as it would be for some people. And we don't think about these things a lot, but that is the point of, of what we're talking about here this morning. What I want to say this morning is that you and I have a sense, we have a very real present. We feel obligated, don't we, to read the Bible? Understand the Bible? And we certainly feel obligated to do what the Bible says, right? To obey it. This is a church of people, individuals, that believe, one, the Bible is the Word of God. Believe, two, that it is an authority. In other words, what the Bible says is more accurate, more true than our opinion. And so whatever the Bible says, that's what we do. If we don't agree with each other, we can go to the Bible and find out what it says about the thing that we disagree about. And when we know what the Bible says, we can come to a place of agreement because we agree with God. But not every single one of us, a uh, one, um, would probably pass a comprehensive exam on the Scripture. You say, Pastor, you don't think so? Well, listen, I did. I passed a Bible comprehensive exam when I was in college. And, I, and uh, I was glad I could pass it. I didn't know I learned anything in college until I took my Bible comprehensive exam yeah. my senior year. And I realized, wow, I know a bunch of stuff I didn't used to know. And uh, I was able to pass my Bible comprehensive exam. They sneaked up on me, taught me things while I wasn't paying attention or something like that. But anyway, sometimes you think, well, I'm not learning much, and then I don't have to move this. It's going to distract me all day. <laughs> I have a mic here. You know, some guys, you know, when you play, when you preach in a gym, you can see them shooting baskets when the, when the <laughs> goal's over your head. Mike's sitting here casting while I'm playing, so I had to get that up. Mike, quit looking at that, okay? Look up here. Eyeballs. Okay. Anyway. Um, but uh, so many times, many times we as believers, though, we, we, we know we're obligated. We know the Bible is the Word of God. We know we should read it. But sometimes it doesn't it seem like it's more of a duty than something that's performed. And sometimes it doesn't seem like if we were to take a Bible comprehensive exam that, you know, 
maybe if pastor were to give us a quiz on Job, or maybe he would give us a quiz on, on uh, Hezekiah, or uh, uh, if you were to get a quiz on uh, the, the minor prophets, I hope you guys are catching some of these things. Anyway, if you were to be quizzed on some of these matters, some of these things, you, you, you wouldn't pass the exam. And so you feel kind of inadequate about it. Well, a couple weeks ago, we looked at a statement here in Luke chapter 6. And I think it's a real help. Now, it is not dismissive of any other command in the Scripture. But Jesus made a statement in verse 47. He said in verse 47, He said, Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he's like. <clears throat> now, when he says, Whosoever cometh to me, whom is he addressing? Who's the audience? We've talked about the last couple. Who? The believers. Believers. What kind of believers? Um, I'll say disciples. That they're disciples. Going. He's been speaking to the multitudes, but in verse 20, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said. And so specifically, he's addressing those individuals who are disciples. Now, what is a disciple? Um, follower. It's a follower, right? Now, literally for Jesus, what would discipleship have meant to be a disciple of Jesus? What's the word? Believer. Follower. What? Somebody say something. Right? Believer. Believer. Yeah, he's a believer, but a follower. But what would that mean if you're a disciple of Jesus and you're a follower of His? Believers. I mean, in other words, you're at work one day. You know, you're downtown. You know, working in some place, and somebody comes by and says, "You a disciple of Jesus?" And you say, "No," but you're a believer. Okay, you're, they, they come, you're working downtown, they say you're a disciple, and you say no, but you're a believer. Is that a bad thing? No. no. Not necessarily. I, I'm tricking you a little bit, because why? Because a follower is with Jesus. Right? So a disciple in the day would be someone who, when Jesus leaves town, leaves town with Him. When Jesus goes to a place, goes to the place with Him. In other words, discipleship was 100%. When Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, calls, uh, right here in, in, this, in this area of Luke, calls uh, Peter and James to be his disciples, they have to leave their occupation and follow him. So a disciple in this context is an individual. You understand this? He's an individual who is following Jesus. Now, if I were to ask the question in this room today, how many of you are disciples it should be, and I believe it would be, that it would be a unanimous affirmative. Yes, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus, right? Wouldn't that be so? At least it would be true for the person sitting in your seat. That's the person I'm addressing right now. Okay, so yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Now, we could rate you as a follower, couldn't we? I couldn't, but you could and Jesus could. And you could say, well, you know what, this is, you know, one to ten, one being worst possible, ten being best possible, I'm a whatever, and you could put a number there and then, you could, you know, you could, you could ask God His opinion. The Holy Spirit could kind of convict you a little bit and kind of show you what kind of a disciple. All of the disciples are not at the same place. They're not all equals, are they? Even the disciples of the Lord Jesus, He had twelve. They weren't all the same. For instance, there was Judas Iscariot, and uh, he'd have been a follower of Jesus. He'd have been a disciple. Uh, that to the other disciples would have been very impressive. They would have looked at Judas, and remember when Jesus said, the one that I give the sop to, he's the one, he's the one who's going to betray me, and he gave it to him, and uh, everybody said, well, who is it? In other words, they thought, there's no way in the world it could have been Judas. There's no way in the world Judas is the one. When, when Jesus said to Judas, now, that thou doest do quickly, and Judas went out, they thought he went out to purchase things to prepare for the Passover, because they would not have believed that he was a fake believer in Jesus, that he didn't wasn't really a disciple. And why would that be? Well, the Bible says he was a thief and he kept the bag. You remember when he was talking about the uh, alabaster being sold and given to, to feed the poor? But Judas kept the bag. In other words, he is the treasurer. He wasn't just a disciple, but he was, an, if you loosely, the idea, he is elected to the position of trust and worthiness. He was a leader of the disciples, Judas was. He made executive decisions for the disciples. And no one would have believed that He would be the one that would betray the Lord Jesus. We know the disciples aren't equals because of Judas. We know the disciples aren't all equal because of Peter, James, and John. You remember the Bible, talk, they, they had experiences with Jesus. Remember Peter in, 
when you read the, the second letter that Peter wrote to the churches, and when Peter wrote that second letter, he talked about being eyewitnesses of His Majesty, the Majesty of the Lord Jesus. He was talking about that time when he and James and John had an experience that was unique. None of the other disciples had the experience of being on the mountain when Jesus Christ was transfigured into His full glory as God. And those three disciples were close enough to the Lord Jesus that they had an experience the other disciples weren't even privy to. They didn't get to have the same experience. Disciples aren't the same. John, in the Gospel of John, never refers to himself as a disciple of Jesus, but he always refers to a disciple of the Lord Jesus as the one whom the Lord loved. John was so intimate and so close with the Lord Jesus that he had an understanding of Christ's personal love for him. And the other disciples didn't refer to themselves the same way that John did, but John, said, John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. So of the twelve disciples of the Lord Jesus, I can name four of them that had a different level of relationship than everyone else did. So are all disciples equals? No. No. Now, we know that the Bible says, draw an eye to God, and He will draw an eye to you. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot say, I wouldn't say, and, and, I, and I have to qualify it because I don't want anyone here today to say, well, you know, God just loves some of us different ways, and God has different kinds of disciples, and that's just the way it is. I have nothing to do with it. No, the Bible says draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. In other words, if you take a step toward God, God will take a step towards you. And you have the permission, you have the command, and God wants you to do so. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You can know God as intimately as you choose. You can have a level of a relationship following Jesus as His disciple. You can have God's supernatural involvement in your life. You can literally be led of the Spirit who is a comforter of the same kind as the Lord Jesus. You can literally live like you are following Jesus. Like He is physically present because He is, because of the Holy Spirit of God who is the Comforter. You literally can follow Jesus just like the disciples did. And I'm telling you something, by faith and by obeying Christ's commands, you can have the same kind of experiences that the disciples have. That's possibility, see. And I'm not saying possibility is, oh, it could happen. I'm telling you, it's what God wants for you. And what you can realize by following Jesus. That's the potential. And so discipleship for every person isn't the same. But Jesus made a statement that just blows my mind. It just really boggles my mind. Knowing what I know about the Scripture and studying the Scripture, Jesus said in verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you to whom he's like. He is like a, uh, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, the, arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. And it talks about the, the person or the disciple who doesn't do what Jesus said. And he's like a person who built his house on the sand. The waves came and the rain, the rain came. The waves beat vehemently against it and the house went splat, as the song goes. Okay? So in this passage of Scripture is a promise that when Jesus lays out His plan for discipleship to the disciples... Now, I, I, we're coming back to something important. If, if you aren't paying attention, come back and pay attention for about 45 seconds. Okay, The promise here is that if you'll do what Jesus said in these words... What words? The words to His disciples. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you're going to be built firmly on the rock. Now, if I were to ask the question this morning, how many of you would like to be able to have a guarantee that you can be so firmly planted on the rock of Jesus Christ that you could be certain about overcoming adversity. Any of us would be interested in that? How would you like to be guaranteed? I mean, you know, the Bible says, let him that stand and take heed lest he fall. And, it's, and that's in Galatians chapter 6 when it talks about a, a weaker brother and, and trying to help restore him when he's in sin and to be careful, consider ourselves. There's several places in the Scripture there's a warning about Christians falling. But if you could just be guaranteed that you don't have to fall. In other words, I'm always afraid when I see a, a brother or sister in Christ fail spiritually, and I mean just, just destroy the testimony in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just think, God, help that not to be me. God, I don't want that to happen. And here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus said, hey, if you hear my words and you do them, you're like a man that built his house on the rock. And it's in one chapter of the Bible and not even the whole chapter. In other words, if I were to ask the question here today, how many of y'all can read the Bible this week? Some of y'all could do it. But it would be a busy week, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be a lot. 
Um, I've done it. I've read the Bible in two weeks. I had a, little, a series of time in my life when I just I was reading the Bible every two weeks, and I spent several hours a day just reading the Scripture. And it was a great time in my life, but I just can't do that all the time. It was a great opportunity. But if I were to ask the question, how many of you could read the Bible this week? You'd say, I don't think I'd get a single taker. I might get some people that maybe say, well, I'll give it a shot. I'll try and just see how I come out. But how many of you could actually do it this week? We doubt our ability to even do that, don't we? But if I were to say, how many of you could read half of Luke chapter 6 this week? If I were to say, how many of y'all could read Luke chapter 6, half of it this week? And do it. There's not a single person here that couldn't do that. And that's why I'm amazed at the promise in Luke chapter 6. It's amazing. Verse 47, Luke chapter 6. I think, huh, oh, really? I mean, God makes something that easy, something that simple. And so the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the commands in Luke chapter 6. We looked at a few weeks ago, we, we, we uh, looked at the Beatitudes, the Blesseds. Blessed be the poor. Blessed, uh, blessed are ye that hunger. Blessed are ye when men revile, hate you. And... and uh, and then talk about woe unto you for different things. We looked at those things, and one of the things we realized is that God's way is very different than man's way. The way God thinks is very different. We don't think it's a blessing to be poor. But Jesus says, you're going to follow me. You're going to understand something. My blessing comes to the poor. Uh, blessed are the people that weep. And you think, you know, something weeping is caused by sorrow. I don't know about you, but I've been in a place where my heart, I just feel like I, it's just going to explode. It hurts so bad. You ever been there? You ever been through so much sorrow? It just feels like you just can't handle anymore? I'll tell you, these, these folks this last week that have lost loved ones, I can feel that. Every time somebody calls me and says, Pastor, you know, this person died in my family. It's just like a gut punch to me. I just feel it. I've been there. I know what it is to lose a loved person. Just, oh, I just, and you just think, I don't, Sometimes I don't want to think about it. I just say, I just can't handle it. I can't hear anymore. Don't tell me. If, if there's bad news, I just don't tell me right now. Tell me later. Because I, I, it'll kill. I just feel like if I hear anymore, it just kill me. You know, and it's just, man, you just you have that feeling. And, and uh, we've, we've been there, haven't we? Almost all of us have. At some point, you will be. If you haven't been there, you will be. We just think, man, blessed, you know, are the, the they that, that hunger and those that weep. Blessed are they that weep. And I think, oh, my goodness, the world, what blessing is there in that? And yet when you see what God can work and what God can do when you're following Jesus and the sorrow of a disciple, my friend, is a blessing. God's way oftentimes is the opposite of man's way. The, the Beatitudes, the things we learn, those things, they're different. We saw that the mindset, how we treat others as a disciple are different. Verse 27 through uh, verses uh, 35 talk about how to treat your enemies. A disciple loves his enemies. It doesn't say a disciple tolerates his enemies. A disciple takes a pacifist position. A disciple loves his enemies. And so it's not just a, well, you know, <laughs> love your friends or love your enemies as long as. No, it's love your enemies. And uh, Jesus points out, he says, it's not really anything if you lend to somebody that you know, if, if, if somebody asks you for something and you give it to them and you think you're going to get something from them, it really isn't giving. But it's really something when somebody takes from you or somebody abuses you or someone misuses you and you treat them as though you love them. That's a little different. And the Bible says it's a blessing for disciples. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. I don't know what I did. Um, now, last week we looked at, two weeks ago we looked at giving. I wasn't here last Sunday morning. And we saw that the, for a disciple that Jesus said, Give and it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down and uh, uh, running over. Or, I'm sorry, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Whatever measure you use to give things out, you know, imagine it this way. Um, you ever see somebody with a big wallet? Some people carry a lot of cash. I, I, have, I don't have any cash. I have some good credit cards here. Uh, I don't have any, I don't have any cash in my wallet. But you know, I grew up in Kansas, and you know, naturally the people there are a little mistrustful. We don't trust the government. We don't trust banks. And so, I knew guys. I mean, they carried serious cash around with them. I mean, wads of cash. I just, I can think of a couple people right now. 
And it's the ones that had wallets. I know one guy, one time, he would carry his cash all summer long, and he would, I don't know if he'd bury it somewhere, he'd do something with it at the end of the summer. <laughs> but he would, all summer long, had a business, he would carry his cash. And I remember he came one time, he pulled out a pocket. I mean, we're talking like hundreds this thick. And another pocket, and he had a pocket here and here and here. I mean, he had, and we counted it up, he gave it to a friend of mine to count. And I think it was something like $40,000 or something in cash, which is a lot of money back in the night. It's a lot of money today in cash, you know. And so he'd carry a lot of it. And uh, if you can imagine the wallet he'd have to have to carry his cash, and imagine him to be a giver. And then imagine this wallet. I, I like slimline wallets. And you can see when I preach, I can't even have things in my pockets. I, you notice I, I'm really fidgety about things. I hate stuff in my pockets. I don't like the way pockets look, and I don't like the way they feel when they're full of stuff. So even a wallet this big is too big for me. And so... Um, now, if you can imagine me having a pocket full of cash, a wallet full of cash, and if you can imagine my friend who had a wallet that would hold $40,000 worth of cash, and you can imagine us both being givers and being limited by our wallets, okay, the measure, the measure we have, in other words, this would be the measure of the cash I could hold. I could probably pack, you know, a couple thousand in here if I worked hard at it. $100 bills, I, I'm sure I'd get several thousand dollars. and. I, but if you can imagine myself and this other person, and you were to say, you know, I want you to give measured out of your wallet, or I want him to give measured out of his wallet, whose wallet would you want to be given from? His, right? Whereas the idea is the measure, you know, whatever it is. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, the measure that you give with is the measure that will be given to you. That's not the prosperity gospel. That really is the way God works. In other words, God gives things to us so we can give them. And if you're standing and you say, well, you know, I can't really afford much. You know, I tell you what, you know, i got a limit on the credit card. That's a credit card. That's not money I have. I don't really have much. And you give that way, you'll find out that that's the way that you get. And by the way, your motivation to give in this passage of Scripture is never so that you can get. Your motivation is to give so you can give. And the more you give, the, the greater the measure with which you give, the greater ability God gives you to give. And that's all you have for anyway. God doesn't give you things so you can accumulate and hold them. He gives you things so that you can use them for Him as a steward of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be, you know, a small wallet giver. You say, Pastor, why do you care? Because I don't like stuff in my pockets and credit cards work anyway. So, anyway, I don't want to be a small measure giver. Do you? I want to be a big measure giver. And that's one of the things that Jesus says about disciples. I want to look at one last truth. One last thing, though, that we haven't looked at that Jesus said about disciples. And it's talking about a matter that I think is so vital, so important. Look at verse 39 with me this morning, will you? Verse 39, the Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them. Here's the parable. You ever heard this one? Can the blind lead the blind? No. Shall they not both fall into the ditch? <laughs> so it's kind of almost a riddle more than a parable, wouldn't you say? The parable is, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Now, this would conjure up humorous uh, humorous analogies, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Can you imagine? Um, no, I'm not going to illustrate. I won't have time. But can you imagine if I had these two fellows and I blindfolded them and I said, Michael, uh, or actually I wouldn't say to Michael. I would say, Jonathan, I want you to lead Michael, you know, down the street and to Wendy's across the street. Now, y'all would have me arrested <laughs> for the, the idea of that, right? Okay. If the blind lead the blind, shall they not both fall into the ditch? That's the idea. Okay? Is, what's the answer to that question? Yes. Okay. Jesus said in verse 40. Now again, he began to speak a parable of them in verse 39. So is the parable is the parable of the blind leading the blind falling into a ditch? Is that the parable? No. That's a that's a riddle, right? It's a concept. It's a pointed statement, but that's not everything Jesus is saying here. So is he done with his parable here? No. No. Okay, so listen. In verse 40, Jesus said, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Jesus said, The best you can do is to be the same as me. You're not going to, you're not going to exceed Jesus. In a Christian life, I think sometimes, believers, we get distracted and sometimes by thinking we're more important than Jesus himself. How so? You know, some Christians really want to have the glory. I've seen, I've seen believers that would like to have the glory that belongs to God. And in their minds, they have exceeded Jesus. In other words, sometimes we as believers think that our life is all about us, and we don't think it's all about Jesus. 
And when you come to the place when you think, God, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and you want it for your sake, but you don't want it for Jesus' sake, you've come to a place when you actually believe in your mind that you've exceeded the greatness of your Master. In other words, if God has a plan for you, and in your mind it isn't as good as your own plan, in your mind you are greater than God. You see it? You get it? God has a plan for you, and in your mind, you have a plan that's greater than God's. In your mind, you are greater than God. Now, I didn't say you're actually greater than God, but Jesus said the disciple's not greater than his master. And so the illustration here is that if you're a perfect disciple, as good a disciple as you could be, you'll be the same as Jesus. You're not going to be better than Jesus because you're a disciple of Jesus. You're a disciple for Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. So, the first truth then that Jesus is helping us to understand in this parable is that a disciple is not greater than his master. You guys get this? What's the first truth? The disciple is not greater than his master. What's the first truth? The disciple is not greater than his master. Okay, now, here's what Jesus said as well. He said, And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that's in thine own eye? The language here is Old English for a speck and a log. Okay? So the idea is you got something in your eye, you sure, yeah, and uh, yet you've got something so big in your eye that you couldn't possibly really see the speck. You're, and for some reason in your mind you're focusing on their speck when you've got a beam in your eye. And of course this is an allusion to Christians who are more focused on the problems or faults of others and meanwhile they overlook gross personal misconduct and faults on their own because they had rather deal with someone else than have God deal with them because they're content and satisfied to be living in sin. Okay, so then Jesus said, Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that's in thine eye, the mote's a speck, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that's in thine own eye, thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that's in thy brother's eye. For a good tree, the Bible says, bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Eddie and I have been battling iguanas. You still battling iguanas, Eddie? Or are you, you still losing to iguanas? I guess is how we can put it. I got some wounds going on. Okay, I, I won some yesterday. Uh, that, I'm not going to tell you how, but I did win. There's blood on my dock. Okay, so anyway, there. Um, Eddie gave me a loquat tree that he'd grown from a seed, and actually it was a pretty good size when he gave it to me. It was in a big pot, and I planted it in my backyard, and it's two-thirds eaten the leaves are. They didn't eat the thorns. I don't know why, but they didn't eat the thorns, but they ate the leaves off of it, and they got two-thirds of it. And I've got, I've got, two, I've got, I've got a vegetation battle on two fronts right now. My grass is doing pretty well, but they, I have these grubs that have turned into some kind of Chinese... Um, what are they, goo? They're Chinese something, or the goo brought them, brought them, put them in my house. Uh, they're not caterpillars, but they're little bugs that, that look kind of like some type of Chinese beetles, and they're eating my loquat tree. And then I got the iguanas eating anything that, that, they can, that they can get their grubby little mouths on. And so there's a little battle in my backyard between the two. And I've got some spray. I'm waiting for a couple days where there's no rain in the forecast to spray the bugs. Anyway, we're battling, we're battling these things. And the reason for it is that I'm, for, I'm, I'm a fruit tree kind of person. The only trees that have been allowed to live at my home are, that aren't fruiting trees are my, um, what are they called now, on the other side of my house? What? Frangie panties. I don't know why I can't remember the name, but they're frangie panties. And you can actually make tea out of, out of the flowers. So I've justified in my mind letting them live. But they are, are absolutely beautiful. They're, and this year they are blooming like they never have before. They are so fragrant. They smell like a kind of like a peachy, a sweet smell. I mean, right now at the front of our house just smells lovely. They're, they're just in full fragrant bloom. Come by and smell them if you like. But they're doing really well. And I haven't made tea out of them yet, but... They're allowed to live because of that, but I like fruiting trees. And when I have a fruit tree, I expect it to bear fruit. I've got a couple of, uh, i got an orange tree seedling started, and I have a, um, a grapefruit tree from some really good oranges and some good grapefruits, and I'm hoping it's not like, you know, the GMO or something like that, something crazy where I won't be able to enjoy the... Um, <laughs> Then where it'll produce a different fruit than I think it's going to produce. But I want to create a fruit salad tree with the um, tree that Eddie gave me, the, local, the, the lime quad tree. I said, what did I say? It's a lime quad tree. So I want to make a fruit salad tree. I want it to grow baby limes and then grapefruit and oranges. I want to graft them in. 
and so forth to make it, and maybe I'll succeed, maybe not, who knows, I might just kill them all as a result of it. But when I do that, I have an expectation of the fruit that they're going to bear. And I wouldn't expect a thorn tree to produce figs, and I wouldn't expect a fig tree uh, to produce thorns. If I grew what I thought was a fig tree and produced thorns, I would do what to it? I'd cast it away. I'd, I'd use it for barbecue. I'd, I'd use it for in my smoker to make barbecue with. Never waste anything. If you can help it. Okay. But I, I would do something with it if it wasn't poisonous. Uh, the Bible says in verse 44, Every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Get this? In other words, when you plant something and you tend it, you have an expectation that it will produce what it's supposed to produce, what it's planted for the purpose it's planted for. And Bible, Jesus concludes his parable this way. He said, for, he says, a good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. No, he said, a good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. And the Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Somebody I know the other day was very unkind to someone else I know. And somebody who observed it said to me, that person that was so unkind spoke more mean things than anybody I've ever heard without swearing. In other words, their account of it was, I never heard somebody say so many mean things without saying anything technically bad. Where did that come from? Came out of the abundance of the heart, right? In other words, something was done, something was, somebody was angry, and they said things that were mean. And the, the source of the meanness is the heart. In other words, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. Have you ever misspoken? I, I, I'll give it to people that we misspeak sometimes, right? You ever said something and when you heard it, you thought, that isn't what I said. In other words, the words didn't come out the way that you intended. In other words, they didn't reflect what you were saying. The words just... Man, I've, I've said some things that are just... I'm just like, wow. I remember a guy one time complimented me on my wife one time, and afterward, he was like, oh my goodness, what did I just say? He told me that my wife was the kind of woman he wished he'd married. <laughs> and what he was trying to say is, your wife is just wonderful, and she's a sweetheart. And But the thing is, he was also married. <laughs> and he called me the next day. He's like, Brother Price, he's like, what I told you about your wife, he's like, oh man, he's like, he's like that's not what I meant to say. I was just trying to say that, you know, I don't even know, I don't want to say what I was trying to say because it just doesn't come out right. He was just trying to tell me my wife's a sweet lady and that, that uh, she's the kind of person that he wished he'd... Well, he said it was, she was the kind of person he wished he'd married. I thought, man, is he going to kill me? Or what? <laughs> you got a wife. Can't have mine. You know, in other words, he, he said something, and, and honestly, he didn't mean it as anything derogatory or negative or that could be taken wrong. It's just the way that he phrased it. He tried to find a way to say it, and he just didn't have a way with words. Okay, can we give it to some people? By the way, you need to be forgiving of people that said things that didn't. When they say, I didn't mean to say it that way, you better realize sometimes you say things and you don't mean to say what people hear or the way the words are phrased. And you can't say that's what's in the heart of the person. Oh, that was the subliminal message that they wish they could say. And they said, no, they, they wouldn't have said what they wish they could have said if that was the truth. So you've got to be forgiving about it. But the Bible does say that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Have you ever had somebody say something really terrible and they meant to say it? I mean, whatever triggered them. You know, I didn't mean to. You know, I lost my temper. I said things I didn't mean. No, you lost your temper and said things you meant. Normally you'd lie. In other words, that's the idea here. And the Bible says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. And the explanation is for the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And Jesus used all these illustrations, the blind leading the blind. He used the illustration of a disciple not being above his master. And he brought all these things to a place, to a head, of saying the most important thing any person can be concerned with is the thing that no person can see. And only sometimes you can catch a glimpse of by what is said, and that's the heart. Friend, I'm done as soon as I conclude. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> tricked you out. Jeremiah chapter 17, I want to read two verses that, that are corresponding. And if you take notes or put parallel passages in your Scripture, I do believe this is a passage of Scripture that positively parallels exactly what Jesus has said in Luke chapter 6. 
Jeremiah chapter 17, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the question is asked, who can know it? And then God answers the question. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on the eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and his end shall be a fool. Now it's interesting, that you follow me here because they're, 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 this corresponds, this relates, but you don't want to miss it. It's interesting that in Luke chapter 6, Jesus is talking about the heart and he's saying out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of a good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of bad treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. And Jesus says these two truths and he says out of the abundance of the heart. In other words, what comes out is what's in the heart. Friend, I have to say to you that oftentimes what's in the heart doesn't always come out. In other words, you and I don't spend enough time with enough people to know everything that's in them, do we? Isn't it amazing how important first impressions are? And isn't it amazing how different people we know are the first time they meet someone? You ever met somebody? I mean, it's like they can be. How are you today? You ever met that person? You know, I know you moms are like that on the way to church. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All the way to church, you're yelling at the kids, trying to get everything just right, yelling at the husband, yelling at, not, maybe not yelling, but, you know, tense. And then you come to church, well, hello, everybody. You know, it's like, that, and the kids are looking at you like, this is not the way the day has gone so far, you know. <laughs> they know how it is. And you dads are like that on your way to work. Anyway, we're all, we, we can be sometimes a little disingenuous about what we actually are, can't we? Sure. Sometimes we can, we can put on our church face or our church speak or church talk, but it isn't what we are at home or in certain places. Sometimes we don't care what people think about us, and sometimes we care too much what people think about us. Because we're not the same all the time. And Jesus is emphasizing what's in the heart. And if you want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to be like a person that hears what Jesus says and does what He says, my friend, you need to understand that what is in the heart matters, not what is on the face or what even comes out of the mouth. Because what comes out of the mouth at the worst of times will be what is in the heart at the best of times or what's in the heart at the uh, or what is in the heart that's good or evil at all times you get this yeah. and my friend there's only one person that can judge the heart there are a couple of sayings I tease people in our church when they use them and it's just kind of for fun but it really is Jeremiah 17 I'm referencing when I do it uh, brother Devin Frost you guys know him as on deputation in New Zealand right now he's always talking about people and he's always saying oh he's got such a good heart and I'm like really you saw his heart <laughs> what it look like you know, is it a big one, little one? You know, everything good? You know, how did how, you see his heart? Did somebody cut him open? You know, I just pick on him about the heart. But the Bible says, you know, the Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. You know where that is, right? When, when Samuel was looking for a king of Israel and he looked at the sons of Jesse and thought they all looked good enough to be kings, and yet God said, I've rejected them. They're not, they look good, but, they're, but what's inside isn't what I want for a king. And then he said, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And Christian, you and I sometimes really fall into this trap. Well, I'll tell you something. Some Christians have no discernment at all. I mean, you can, you can be <clears throat> fooled and deceived by anybody because you're looking for signs that you think show you what somebody's heart looks like. And I just want to tell you something. You don't have a clue. You have no idea what's in somebody's heart. The only person's heart that you can know is the heart the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 through 11 and that's your heart. The Bible asks the question, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What's the answer to it? Nobody. Except God. The question is, Pastor, who do we have in our church that has discernment? that can see the heart. I'll tell you the people in our church. Charlie. Charlie has discernment in our church. Right? Charlie, you watch out because he knows about you. <laughs> He's like Mr. Nice Guy, always polite, always nice, but he knows he knows what's bad about you too. That guy, Mr. he picks up on things. I'll ask, I ask Charlie's opinion about a lot of things and he nails stuff sometimes and he'll just have something. He'll say, you know something? And he'll give me a reason for it. But Charlie, he's one of those subtle guys. Nobody knows what he knows. He doesn't tell people what he knows, but if I ask him, he'll tell me. And I'll think, man, he got that too. Boy, he really knew that person. Sometimes when I'm thinking about something or somebody for a position or for leadership or something, I'll go talk to Charlie about it and say, Charlie, what do you think about this? And sometimes he'll tell me something I didn't know. He'll tell you, you know, 
here's something, and it's not because he's a judgmental person. Well, he is a little bit. And not because he's a judgmental person or anything. It's just because he just, I think the Lord's given him a gift of discernment. He really catches things. But I'll tell you how, how many hearts Charlie has looked at. Zero. And you haven't either. I don't know how many times people come in and say, Pastor, that person's a really good Christian. I think you haven't the slightest clue. You think they're a good Christian because you saw something. And you thought it was reflective of the heart, but the truth of the matter is it had nothing to do with the heart. You didn't see the heart. You have no idea. Sometimes people compliment me, and I think, you just don't know me. I say, you have no idea. You say, Pastor, you must be a pretty bad guy talking like that. I think you're pretty bad too. <laughs> God told me so. He said the heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And I believe that about you. And I believe it about me. Because God said it. So many times, Christian, we think that we can look at something and oftentimes we judge God when we do so. Sometimes we'll take a circumstance in someone's life that's contrary to what the Scripture says and we'll look at somebody and say, you have the best of reasons for doing that. And what we're actually saying is God's wrong. We do that, don't we? Why? Because we think we're looking at a person and they're better than God says they are. You know what God says? He said, The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And friend, here's where the rubber meets the road. Your heart naturally, in and of itself, is not the kind of heart that a good man out of good treasure bringeth forth good things. And yet it can be. And here's two ways that you can realize that. First of all, Jeremiah 17 says, I, the Lord know the heart. He said, I try the reins thereof. You know what reins do? Reins are what leads and guides. And God said, I try it. I pull this way and see which way you go. I pull this way and see what happens. Try the reins. You may have ever uh, ridden horseback enough to know the difference between a horse that's trained for Western style and English style. And I have friends that train horses with a mix of the two. And I mean, you grab a hold of the horse and you pull right and he goes left. Or you get a hold of a horse and he wants to guide you with his knees or hold the reins in one hand, you know, and go like this. Some horses, you know, you ride two-handed. Well, God said, when I get in your heart, I find out what kind of, what, what's been trained. He said, I pull the rein, I find out what comes out, find out which way you go. You know, God brings circumstances into your life that are trying the reins of your heart. Sometimes you, you, you come to circumstance and the response that you have is, God, you have no business doing that in my life. And God says, I found out what's in your heart. Sometimes something will happen in your life and boy, it'll be a sweetness like when when uh, incense or myrrh is crushed and it brings forth a good... When something's good is crushed and something comes out of it, it's just, boy, it's a sweet-smelling savor and it's a blessing to God and it's, and it's a blessing to others. You ever seen somebody go through something really hard and what was there came out? Man, sometimes people surprise me. I, I can, I'm thinking right now of a man. I was thinking, I was preparing this message. I'm thinking of a man that I thought was a great Christian. And something didn't work out in his heart and he cursed God. And yet I can think of people that I thought, you know what, I don't really know if they even know the Lord that well. I don't think they know the Bible that well. I don't think they're that great a Christian. And I thought that about them and I saw them go through something and demonstrate God's grace in their life that was an encouragement to everyone around them. God knows those things. But you know what God knows that I want to know, God knows me. And He knows me better than anything else. It, 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 it's a little bit of a confusion to me when the Bible asks who can know, and I think, who, me, me? Well, if the heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, I can't even know it. And so how do I find out what's in me? You know, there have been times in my life, and I'm being as transparent as I possibly can, when I've prayed to God, I said, God, if I've got a wrong motive, and God said, you do, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm dealing with it the right way. I'm everything. And I said, God, you know what? And I just stopped to ask God, God, you tell me if there's any, any motive in me where you know, I'm just acting in my flesh. And God says, here it is. And I think, I, anybody would agree I was right. But I was wrong because God knew my heart. My heart was wrong. If your heart's wrong, my friend, I don't care what you do. And God doesn't either. Because that's where He tests. That's where He tries. That's where He judges. You know, God's not impressed with the things that impress us. We do look on the outward appearance. You know, what you do sometimes reflects what you are. I understand that. But God knows what you are. And you know, sometimes Christians, I think we care so much about what is on the outside and we care so little about what's on the inside. 
and the reverse should be true, shouldn't it? And this is where we find our place of conviction and invitation. You hear this morning, you know what God's Word said. You know the promise, don't you? Luke chapter 6, verse 47, He that heareth my words and doeth them, he's likened to a man. He's like a man that built his house on a rock and he digged down firm and he built a foundation. And the rains came and the floods came and yet the house stood fast. But the person that hears God's words and doesn't do them as a person is like a foolish man that without building a foundation just puts up a structure and the rains come and the floods came. He had no preparation for them at all just like South Carolina last week. <laughs> I was there. I, I didn't make it to church here last Sunday night because I got caught in a flood in South Carolina where they have no provision for flooding at all. It's amazing. You and I can be just like a person who just expects that they're never going to have adversity in their life. They're never going to have hardship. And all of a sudden, something comes along and it finally it tests us. It checks the metal of what we're made of. And guess what? We are wiped out. We're destroyed. What would it take to destroy you? You know, you can ask that question hypothetically, can't you? Every time I'm doing premarital counseling with couples about to get married, I ask, I ask some hypotheticals. What could this person do where you would say that's enough? And it's amazing sometimes the answers. Well, if he did this or she did this or if this happened, that would be something. It's pretty reflective of the unconditional character of your love. And you know, sometimes God does that with us. You can ask the question, you know, if this happened in my life, I've heard Christians sometimes say, you know, if God did that to me, I don't know, and I just think, my goodness. You know who knows what is in your heart? God does. And don't you think we ought to ask Him? Don't you think we ought to ask Him? When was the last time you took time, you spent time, you said, God, search me, know my heart, like David did. Remember in Psalm 52? He said, show me if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of life everlasting. You ever taken a time of contrition where you've just let God do business with you? You may have come here this morning and you thought, well, I'm glad Pastor Price isn't one of those, you know, hellfire and brimstone guys because, you know, he'd strike out on me. There's just nothing wrong in my life. You know, I hope he isn't looking for my sin trying to figure out what it is so he can preach it. That's what I do all week long, by the way. I sit at home twiddle my thumbs and try to think of what your sin is so I can preach about it. I'm joking. But you know, sometimes we just think, well, God, if you talk to me, I'll answer. I'll respond. But when's the last time you and I took the position of God? I'd like to hear if you have anything to say. When's the last time you came on a Sunday morning and you said, God, I want to worship you today, but I also want to do something. I want to check up. I want to know if there's anything wrong in me. I'm told when you go to a doctor, sometimes they find things. I'll find that out someday, probably. When you have God check you sometimes, my friend, you ask the question, but you think, well, God's not going to find anything. Let me fix everything real quick, and I'll have God in to look around. My friend, when's the last time you let God tell you what's in your heart? What the motive is behind it, what the purpose is behind it. Sometimes I think we don't want to hear what He has to say. We wouldn't ask because we don't want Him to tell us. But I'd like to ask you this morning to ask God that, and that's our invitation. Let's pray, shall we? Father, collectively we recognize that You bless people that honor You. God, there's no way as individuals we could know what's in the heart of anyone else but God, I know that You want this entire church to have a heart that pleases You. And that's necessary individually. Lord, starting with me, this morning we need examinations. We need You to look at us and say, this is what's there and here's the motive behind it. So many times, God, we, we close our ears to Your Spirit and we refuse to listen when you tell us things or when you show us things that aren't what they appear to be or the way we try to present them to be. And God, one of the most fearful things is this reality that we can deceive our own hearts. We can literally have motives that we ourselves 
are not aware of because we've told our own lies and believed them. And God is a revealer of hearts, is a person who exposes what's there. God, we don't need what's in us to be revealed to one another. But God, we need what's in us to be revealed to ourselves so that we can be pleasing to You. God, I ask You to bless in the invitation this morning. You'd move in it. Lord, if there would be a person here this morning that what's in the heart wouldn't matter because they don't even have Jesus living in them. They don't have the Spirit who is the presence of Christ dwelling in them. God, I pray that the matter of salvation would be the matter for this invitation they'd take care of this morning. For every other one of us, Lord, I pray that You would examine us and that You would that you would show us what's in us and lead us in the way of life everlasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a moment. We're going to have an invitation. The invitation this morning is simply to respond to what God has said. We don't have our pianist, and I haven't looked up our song, but I want to sing, Search Me, O God. And as we sing, uh, let me see if I can find it. It may not be in this hymn. Somebody tell me what it was. 166. Thank you, Mrs. Dolan. Did you have that memorized? No, I just opened up to it. Wow. Page 166. Search me, O God, and as we sing, would you let God search you? In other words, if it isn't true and you're saying, search me, O God, don't say it for our sake. Say it to God. If it isn't true, don't say it. Because God will do that if you ask Him to. And wouldn't you want Him to? There's something in your heart that should Wouldn't you want God to show it to you so you could be cleansed? Search me, O God, or cleanse me, O God. That's what it is. I... I, I call it search me, please. Thank you, Mrs. Dillon. Search me, oh God, know my heart today. I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet. And as God's spoken to you, you do business with Him here this morning. We're just going to have a very simple invitation. And as we sing the words of the song, may it be a prayer of our heart. Search me, oh God, and know my heart today. Good to have some folks visiting. Good to have uh, Terry and Connie. Always nice to have you guys. What a blessing. You know, Terry uh, could tell mean stories about me. It wouldn't be mean stories. He'd tell true <laughs> stories about me, probably from when I was a kid. But he never does, as far as I know. So he's always welcome. I'm just kidding. He uh, one of the nicest teachers you ever met. Very long-suffering uh, he was. We talk about that all the time, my brother and I. Yeah, Mr. Riffle. Well, we pushed him. <laughs> he could sure take it. So... 
What a blessing they have them here. What a blessing they've always been in their family. Let's dismiss with prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for meeting with us. And it always is a privilege uh, to have your word and to have believers. You know, open this book and to see what it says to us. And God, I, I just think that your word reveals to every one of us the importance of the heart. God, we really would want to be a people whose house is built in such a way that when the rains and the floods come, that the house would stand firm. And we know that Jesus Christ is a solid rock. The problem isn't with the foundation. is isn't with the cornerstone. God, oftentimes we're not, we're not anchored on You. We're not digged down and built on You like we should be. And this matter of the heart is one that often we could ignore. And I pray that You would help this to be ever-present in our minds, that we are not what we say we are. We are what You see in us. And I pray that You would teach us this truth continually and help us to apply it and live it. In Jesus' name we ask now. Amen.